Should we start? Guess we should. Um, so I am not Nick Weaver. Uh, you might have seen in the program, uh, Nick was going to come and talk about um, telemetry and, and various aspects of gathering telemetry and how to scale the gathering of telemetry. And pretty late last week, it turned out Nick couldn't make it. So he asked me if I would come and talk about something to do with telemetry, and I said yes. Um, but it's not going to be quite what Nick was going to bring. So to introduce myself, um, I work in Intel Labs. Um, we have a, a group of researchers who are here in Europe primarily, and we're focused on infrastructure management and orchestration. So quite a bit of our work is in the telemetry area, and we consider telemetry to be foundational, actually, to how orchestration um, can evolve to making best use of infrastructure characteristics and delivering services at scale. So. Um, To start with some obligatory uh, charts with lots of X's, um, lots of things increasing. Um, I think there are eight X's there in total. Um, so um, lots of stuff happening and, and more and more and more so. So we've all seen these, uh, these pictures. So this is a slide actually from Nick, um, which is um, his version of a business view of, of orchestration and what happens. So it's following somewhat of a, a, life, a life cycle here where you've got capacity planning and, and through your capacity planning you you send some configuration through to how you do workload placement, um, how you do rebalancing, um, and you somehow kind of cross-pollinate uh, what your observations are there. And then post facto or during, you do your billing and show back. But the point is that monitoring is at the center of all this. Um, really, you're flying blind unless you have um, uh, appropriate monitoring. And from a, from a lab's perspective, from our view, um, we have been trying to increase both the, uh, the precision and, and fidelity of what we monitor, but also to um, not create some kind of explosion of unusable data. So, so working towards metrics that actually are meaningful and make sense. So um, our work is very applied, by the way. So I'll talk in a, in a moment about um, the balance of kind of medium term research against the, the more uh, practical proofs of concept we do. But everything we do is, is driven by some kind of problem statement. And you can see what some of these are here. Really, they're, they're really about maximizing revenue um, and pushing down operating costs, getting best use of your assets. Um, cost down, performance up is kind of what it amounts to. Um, so there are, there are various use cases that underpin the, the research projects we do, as well as underpinning the, uh, the trials and POCs that we do. Um, both uh, collaboratively and, and internally, then directly with the business units. So to the question of how do you do that automatically and at scale, well, first you've got to step back. And what you see is there's a lot going on. So this is just uh, a small snapshot, a very bounded snapshot of a small number of services running, actually from our, from our test bed. I might be able to show a demo um, of some work we're doing here in, in just a while. But the point is when you have um, overbooking um, on the infrastructure and when you have long-lived and short-lived services coexisting and different types of stacks that you set up for different kinds of services, you get quite a bit of complexity and indirection and multiple levels of abstraction. So if you're trying to see what's going on down here, uh, low level in the stack, um, you know, PCM type counters and as you step up through stuff like SAR and then up to, to service level metrics, figuring out the relationship between those is not trivial. But if you can figure out the relationship, you land yourself onto a very powerful insights. Um, this is basically what's, what's backing um, the, the bulk of the research we're doing. Um, this is what we're trying to chase, is how do we get those nuggets? And how do we do it through automation? How do we do it at scale? This is what we're after. So stepping back then to a more kind of um, business perspective here, um, the, uh, the messaging that's coming from our, our partners in the business unit, the, uh, the data center group, on orchestration is, is expressed in, in this kind of language. So it's basically you watch, you decide, and you act. Watcher, decider, actor are the kind of functional elements that, uh, that Nick would use. And you're collecting data. You're looking right up and down the stack from the, the physical platform to the various uh, virtualization layers and onto the app and service itself. And over time, you try and learn some models and establishing heuristics and establishing correlations and teasing true correlations and figuring out where the causalities actually are. And then you can tune your rules, tune your policies. Um, we've been, over the past few years, manually going through this process. So gathering the relevant data and figuring out what sort of statistical analysis to do over the data, uh, how we can infer what impacts quality of service and what impacts efficiency. And more recently, we're in the space of 
now we've got these workflows stood up, how can we start automating the workflow, workflows? So that's kind of where we're at right now. And we're kind of stepping through a sort of problem statement by problem statement and workload by workload using actually real workloads. So to introduce our work in our, in our lab, and a couple of my colleagues are in the room here, by the way, um, we this year um, took what we had established over a number of years of collaborative research, much of which is, is through the FP7 mechanism, by the way, for anybody in the room who's involved in research in the European uh, research area. Uh, you have these collaboration mechanisms that help universities and industry come together and, and align state-of-the-art advancement to actually um, dealing with, with actual real issues. So we've been quite active in this space over the course of the seventh framework. We'll have executed, I think, 12 or 13 projects in our, in our lab, and we're, we're uh, in the process of setting up some H2020 right now. So that's kind of medium-term stuff that's five years kind of horizon-type research. And what we started doing this year was we took um, what we've been doing to date and some of our active work, and we drove some integration. So we, we have this, uh, this name for it. We call it Apex Lake. And what Apex Lake actually is, is it's a framework um, and uh, an actual functional environment for conducting PLCs and research. Um, it's integrating orchestration research that we've been involved in um, from multiple of these uh, types of focus areas. Um, and it's, a, it's also a reference for collaboration. So much of our work is collaborative. Uh, we've got many ways to collaborate with organizations, either through uh, you know, grant-funded consortia or direct bilateral stuff or MOUs with universities. Um, so we've got all these things in place, and we're really keen to learn from the perspectives beyond our organization. So what's the perspective of a software developer or of an operator or a telco or a PAS provider, um, for example? It's not a product. I'm going to say that about five times at least, maybe even 20. I've been asked to, uh, <laughs> I've been asked to emphasize this. Apex Lake is not a product, it never will be. Um, it's basically a labs initiative, um, and we do actually work quite closely with the product groups jointly. Um, so, so basically, it steps through this kind of cycle of monitoring and then figuring out what the workloads are looking like. Can we express what's interesting about a workload um, parametrically in such a way that um, you know, a rules-driven system can make sense of it? Um, what do we capture? Um, in the past, well, currently, um, through uh, constructs like what ITIL have for CMDB, there are ways of expressing the landscapes. Uh, we've been looking at those and adding some dimensions to those. So in particular, context. Um, there's not much out there that effectively captures context of the infrastructure and the services. And we've been working towards that. I'll explain that more in a moment. And then how do you reason over that? in terms of initial placement of a workload or even adjustment over time? Can you um, draw an inference based on what's observable low in the stack and what's observable at the service itself as to what might be going wrong or where an efficiency opportunity might be uh, uh, untapped? And then we finally do some actuation. We trigger it back into an orchestration system and, and something happens. So that's kind of what we do and, and that's what I'm gonna be talking about actually. So I'm gonna step my way around some of these functions um, I'm happy to, to take questions at any time, by the way, and I'm going to try and move fast deliberately so we do have time for questions, because I'll be asking questions, hopefully. Um, I'm here to learn. I only found out on Friday evening, by the way, I was speaking here, <laughs> so, so hence why my profile is a bit slim. Um, this was kind of a, a, an unexpected uh, change of plan. So start with the watcher. So you can, lots of people have scripts in place. Any sysadmin will have lots of uh, scripts they run that kind of traverse the system and do lots of SAR and TOP and all this kind of stuff, and it's fine. Um, but really, you're probably not instrumenting apps you wrote, right? So you don't know what the code is doing inside. Uh, you don't know what it's expecting to see. Um, you don't know what else is coexisting with it. Uh, if you've got three VMs sharing a node, you don't necessarily know what's going on in the other VM or how it's getting on. There's a whole bunch of information that you are not looking at, and probably for good reason, because there's probably too much information there. So, so we're digging in there trying to find out, okay, let's have a look in and let's try and extract out what's actually meaningful. So one piece of work that we've had ongoing for a few years now, and it actually has its origins in an FP7 research project called IOLANES, uh, where we were chasing bottlenecks in a virtualized stack, is uh, our instrumentation, which we call Merlin. And what Merlin is, it's an approach to uh, doing fairly fine-grained um, um, like tens or hundreds or thousands of hertz type um, 
time series capture right across the whole stack. So from the application, through all the layers, right down to the physical infrastructure through, uh, for example, PCM counters. Uh, it's capturing core and uncore counters. So core is stuff like the processor utilization. Uncore is stuff like LLC hits and misses, TLBs, etc. Um, and then when we gather all this information, and usually you gather hundreds of thousands of data points for a short five minute experiment, uh, we apply statistical analysis. So we've, over the years, identified a series of configurations of stuff like PCM to do dimensional reduction and covariance and various box and tail plots. And we've established a workflow that very, quick, very quickly guides us to what's interesting about a particular service configuration. And at this point, we can very quickly tell where the bottleneck is and check, is it in the right place? Because sometimes it is. You know, you, you your constraint says you should subordinate to your constraint. So the bottleneck has to be somewhere. But if it's in the wrong place, then you're wasting money. So an example of some work from last year on that is, is a proof of concept we did, which was looking at the effective performance of a pretty heavyweight um, analytics database on one large machine. So it was a 40 core, one terabyte machine with a full in-memory database. And SAR was kind of saying, well, it's OK. Everything's 100%. Um, these expensive cores are all being well utilized. And when we dug in, uh, things started to get interesting. And specifically, what we found was, as we increased the parallelism of the queries, the latency of the query was rising linearly with it. And then we looked more closely, and we were seeing that the IPCs were, were quite low but stable, and we were getting um, interesting patterns of LLC hits and misses. And anyway, what we found out was that 40% of the cycles were spent servicing cold TLBs, and essentially the memory access patterns were 100% random across a four-region NUMA system, and the effective utilization was only 60%. So um, the message back to you know, the coders was try to figure out something on memory um, locality um, or numer awareness, and you'll get, you know, a, a pretty substantial uh, throughput increase. Because if you're running these databases in memory, that's pretty expensive business, right? It's uh, RAM is expensive, a terabyte's pretty expensive per node, and it's expensive in terms of energy densities and all kinds of operational stuff that goes with it. So um, this was new insight. Um, for, for the, from the point of view of the application itself, because previously it had been kind of you know, hand carved with VTune and then checked with SAR. But when you look at everything in between the full IO subsystem and you can check that the bottleneck is not quite where you thought it was, you, you basically learn something. So that's an example, just one example, and we've done others. Um, we've looked at network type workloads, um, uh, CDNs, found some very interesting, non obvious stuff, uh, stuff that was configuration. Um, sweet spots that were actually contrary to what the system vendor was saying, right? So, so we proved that out. And actually, some of that work has gone to the, um, the Etsy ISG uh, Mano group that was mentioned in the session, two sessions ago in here uh, by Adrian and the guys that were talking about uh, SDI. So that's, that's the metrics. Um, where do we go with the metrics then? So we have this info core. So I mentioned this kind of thing that started out kind of like a CMDB. And, and we had this term, we'd call it CMDB on steroids. Um, so what we're doing is we're trying to basically capture the full, the full stack. We're trying to capture the relationships across the various layers. So for example, across the virtualization plane and then through the layers. So what are the relationships of dependency um, and, and you know, noisiness or you know, good neighborliness or whatever the term is uh, as you traverse up and down the stack. Now the reason this is really important is because the level of abstraction is actually increasing. If you look at stuff like the Open Compute Project and disaggregation in data centers, where the point comes where you could basically stand up a logical appliance based on a, you know, an OVF, you don't necessarily know where all of the, you know, the, um, the resource elements are coming from. So unless you have a, a global view, you're probably not optimized straight out of the box. So we wanted to create an information representation that would allow us to pretty much arbitrarily extend the abstractions on either way. So we can basically capture what's the SLA saying and roll all the way through to, you know, at some point in the future, what's going on with a particular SSD in a particular sled and a particular tray of a fully disaggregated data center and, and capture everything in between, yeah? So is this another representation of OpenStack? So you have like, for example, if you use 
you know, something like uh, Puppet, Puppet has its view, right? Mm -hmm. OpenStack has its view. Heat has its view. Is this a, another view yet? Or in ways, yes. In ways, yes. But actually, for convenience, we pre-populate with a lot of stuff from the Nova database. Because <laughs> this is research, by the way. So, I mean, our, 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 we don't want to necessarily let's do the best we can from integrating with what's here in 2014. We're kind of trying to rethink what would be the best possible view, and then we run some experiments. And one of the reasons I got quite interested in coming here today was we're at the point now of thinking about, okay, well, practically, with what's there, we know what's a path to making use of something like this. We don't want to come up with some other big kind of god database that says, oh, no, everything else has to go away. This is the thing. That's not the idea. So what we're trying to do here is saying, well, well what if you did have full visibility? You know, and, and this uh, actually, um, yeah, I'll talk in a moment about um, why we keep this stuff somewhat outside of what already exists. But um, the discussions we're interested in having is, is at what point do we start bringing some of these concepts towards projects that are in flight? So um, the key point is that we capture this context. Um, and I'll actually do, I'll try and do a demo in a while. Let's see how the network plays out. Um, Hopefully, I can, I can give you guys a, a demo of what this actually looks like. And then the, the near final piece, um, which is where we start moving from decider into actor, is how do you reason over data like this? This is the point where we start trying to reconcile, OK, here's all our you know, observations across the landscape, across how the services are behaving. And we reference those then against the KPI um, or some policy element and say, well, are we optimal or are we not? And for now. Uh, what we've, we've created is a, a framework that is pluggable. So we can basically plug analytics workloads, workbooks. We use the term workbooks um, that can be simple Python scripts that can then pull external algorithms and look for something that's interesting. Um, so the example here was on placement optimization. And, and what was observable was that this, this particular example was Ceph. And there was a suboptimal situation that you can automatically detect by reconciling statistics, and you can use that then to trigger a re-optimization. So I think, yeah, uh, the next slide will help put that somewhat in context. This is kind of the flow. Uh, so we do the monitoring. We do the fingerprinting. Um, for now, we're, we're fingerprinting fairly basically. So we're looking at, um, this is one, you can't see the text here, I can see it. Um, so it's basically reads and writes with uh, CPU and I think it was something to do with networks down here. Um, and we looked at three different configurations of a service and looked at where the kind of max out type uh, situations were going on. So you can basically experiment with different um, configurations of a service and look at parametrically. You can actually automatically derive a parametric representation of what those differences actually are, which is important because then you can have automation. So you can, you can basically have policies and reasoners that will allow you to trigger a better result. So that's kind of how it works. Finally, then we have the actuation. And for now, it's, it's kind of a hack, really. Um, we're simply um, um, intercepting the, um, the scheduler, the filter scheduler, uh, with hints. Or else we're manipulating the heat templates on the fly. So not really doing anything with OpenStack code. We're just, we're, I think we're still on Havana. Um, we haven't touched a line that stuff. Um, we have a, um, actually, next slide will help. Mm -hmm. We haven't worried about that yet. Um, there's some other work going on. Really, it's the fingerprinting for now. I mean, we know intuitively that a database is different from a transcoder, is different from something else. Um, but that in itself doesn't really tell you a whole lot. Because you know, within transcoding or within databases, there's a whole bunch of other kind of potential complexity. So what we're doing here is, is we're looking up and down the stack at everything, and we're seeing, well, where's the bottleneck? Um, and is it in the right place? And is the context of this particular running service relative to everything else that's running, like is the full service landscape in a reasonable state of optimization? Or should you move something out to another node, you know, knowing that utilization might drop, but you might gain a bit in terms of service performance? That's what we're at right now. There is some separate work going on on classification that this is feeding into, but we're not so interested right now in that particular detail. So um, the last thing I had in terms of, of slides was this one, I think, almost. And the key point here is 
we, like, we've been running a series of, of tests all year, actually. Um, basic you know, experiments on uh, you know, bench workloads. Uh, we've done transcoders and databases. Um, and then we've worked with some um, industry partners on some network type workloads and database type workloads. And this would be a fairly typical uh, con uh, configuration for something that would use something like OpenStack. And the key point here is that our work, the Apex Lake work, we're progressing this because we want to see you know, what happens when you can finally get visibility into everything and you have a way of automating, turning that visibility into insights that are actionable. That, that's kind of what we're chasing. So each of these pieces is in, currently set up to, to coexist with and complement what can happen with an orchestration system or a cloud OS like OpenStack. As I said at the start, this is not a product. Um, some pieces of it are interesting to the product guys, but what's interesting to us is, um, and a conversation we'd like to start having, is are there things going on here that could be interesting to evolving scheduler type capabilities in OpenStack? Um, and are there things that are going on here that could help you know, move on you know, current or future OpenStack projects, for example? Uh, so, so this stuff, we're not tied to this being um, you know, on a path to any particular product. We're, we're perfectly happy if, if the community is interested in this way of approaching things, then we're very interested in, in seeing if we've got something in common in terms of motivation and, and, and views on things. So that's, that's the slides. Um, I could take a risk here now and try and do a, a little bit of demo just to quickly step through what this stuff tends to look like. Um, now the resolution is not going to be my friend here, I think. Sure enough. Uh, So this here is some time series data um, from our test bed. This is live, by the way. Um, and it's basically showing a, it's bandwidth reads and bandwidth writes. The UI is pretty primitive. I mean, it's not, <laughs> this is not shiny stuff for sure. So basically you go in, you say from one day ago, every 10 seconds, give me system metrics, which are of type either bandwidth read or bandwidth writes. And you can see here, the pattern of services that have been set up and torn down over about a 24 hour period. Um, this is not going to be easy, but if I can find the other tab, um, there's some, yeah, that's harder to read. That's some utilization level stuff. I'll skip over that. Uh, next one here. This one is shiny. Um, we do have somebody in the group who's a little bit of a graphics aficionado. Um, and here's a representation of our test bed, actually. I think it's 12 or 13 physical nodes in this particular corner. And you can see here what the dependencies are from service level through the virtualization down to allocation physical. Um, this is new, by the way. This, this version just got put in place about 15 minutes before we got in here. And I'm not sure exactly what the, the movement type stuff denotes. That wasn't on the version that was there an hour ago. Um, <laughs> the guys are kind of playing around with um, some information visualization theory here as well. But what we can do with this is we can go in, we can step in and see well, what's going on. Um, and I'm trying to find one that would have a suitable uh, pattern to talk about ways that we're moving into traversing this. I give up. I'll just look at the whole thing. So right now, um, some, some work we're doing over the coming weeks is um, writing uh, scripts that traverse the subgraphs, the service subgraphs here, and if, for example, you have a, a physical node that is shared across multiple resources, from a system point of view, it's interesting to know um, how the service level performance is patterning out over multiple um, tenants. And if that information can, in context with the metrics of the node, tell you whether you've got the appropriate multi-tenanting going on or not. So, um, this is the type of contextual information we can then feed back into the, uh, the info core. And over time, then, you can really refine your, your policies to have best sharing or you know, placement uh, across the infrastructure. Uh, there's one more I might be able to show here. This is going to be hard. So again, we're back in the ugly, ugly stuff again. Um, so this is the analytics framework. And we've got a series of workbooks in place um, I'll, try and, I'll try and zoom in on one there. It's kind of hard to do it from here. I can't really see. Just 
just to show you what some of these look like. Which one is that? Some are more easily interpreted than others. I'm going to try and find an easy one to interpret. Maybe this one. So this is covariance. So if you're interested in seeing, um, there you see the script itself. Uh, if you're interested in knowing where there is covariance across full system metrics, well, a workbook can tell you that. And why might that be interesting? Well, in this particular case, we set up a kind of a toy um, workload on the bench that had a little smartphone app that was um, interacting with some um, quark type systems at network edge and then running a, you know, a, basically a canned um, application on the back end. And what the covariance tells you is that, this is no surprise obviously, but it can infer it itself with no guidance, is that the, um, as you see an increase in, in cell phone users um, um, accessing the app, then your uh, VM starts to need more disk space. So that's not rocket science, any human knows this. But the point of this work is to take the stuff that any human could figure out and look at millions of those scenarios in real time and be able to trigger adjustments uh, pro preemptively. Uh, so that's an example of how a workbook can be executed. Um, and we've got, we've got many others. Um, and we, we've made use of external machine learning algorithms as well. So back on the, uh, back in PowerPoint land, uh, I was, where are we going next? So where are we going next with the integration work? So some more kind of past research that's still on our shelf. We did quite a lot of work on SLAs some years ago, uh, machine readability and SLA, manage, SLA management stacks, service and SLA awareness right up and down the stack. So that's kind of ready now to start popping in and integrating with this work. Um, so we will probably move on to some classification work. As I mentioned, there, there is some work happening elsewhere in the company on classification and we're working with those guys. So we may do some, some modeling around that. And then the whole thing about service onboarding is um, an interesting area as well. Uh, we think that there's some stuff that could be done there to say, okay, got the task, uh, got the heat, have the OVFs, but what next? What else could you be doing uh, in the first kind of 10 minutes, the first hour, the first several hours of a service lifetime um, to see what it's really doing? Because what we have found is that what it really does is not quite what it says it was going to do. Longer range stuff that we're doing then, so we've got some... Um, work underway actually. Uh, I've got a cons consortium work going away on, going on on, on real-time automatic application adaptations. So an application can intercept and interpret telemetry information from the infrastructure itself and understand what's going on and execute different code blocks. Um, heterogeneity is very interesting. Um, it's just standing up a new project right now um, that's going to look at pretty much um, unconstrained heterogeneity across FPGA, GP, GPUs, core, um, uh, mic type coprocessors and data centers and, and how would you manage that? And then an area we're quite interested in as well is, is this whole DevOps approach to um, service delivery. And we have some background work on visual analytics um, that's been applied in manufacturing, in very high volume manufacturing that we think would be interesting to bring in there in terms of future DSS type tools for um, policy tuning in a DevOps environment. So that's kind of our default plan, say going into 2015 and a little bit beyond. And I guess, well, we're interested in questions. We're interested in hearing, you know, what does the, what do the OpenStack uh, community think about this kind of approach to things? And is there some common ground? And I'm bang on time. Um, yes, actually. So the, um, the heterogeneity project that I mentioned um, has a HPC uh, element in there. Yeah, yeah. Uh. Sure. Um, will some of the work that you guys are doing with um, in this research flow through into OpenStack projects like uh, Solometer? Because it obviously also enables um, being able to meet the performance and build that based on uh, uh, performance or other parameters? It absolutely could do. And in actual fact, um, the Merlin instrumentation that I mentioned earlier can already feed into Solometer. Um, the reality of our group is we're a small team. And so we're only constrained by our own bandwidth. Um, so really, all this kind of stuff, yep, that sounds fantastic. Uh, who, can we, who can we share the load with? Yeah. Another question? Well, that's, that's, unfortunately, there's not much you can do about that. I mean, we can run at fairly high sampling rates. Um, 
we have found, I mean, look where you're starting from, right? So accelerometer is about one hertz. And, and we're running at, you know, hundreds and thousands of hertz. So already we're getting richer data. That, and and we're, this is across like a thousand parameters at a time. So for now, that's quite enough for us to be getting on with. Um, <laughs> and if we've exhausted this particular vein with the level of sampling we're doing, then maybe we'll go back and increase again. But yeah, for sure, sampling error is a reality. Um, but we're working at several orders of magnitude, more fine-grained data than what exists ordinarily today. Yeah, so we've, we've, just, we've just tried to assess it on its own, and it's actually, the probes are unmeasurable on a server class machine. Uh, we did run it on a Galileo board, and I think it came out at 0.4% CPU, 0.4%, which is less than the top command. So it's very lightweight script, um, even, as, even in scripted form, it's, it's very lightweight, but we haven't done comparisons beyond that. You can program it. So you can send a profile with the probe, and you can change it over time. So you can send down an initial configuration, then you can go back and change that. You can tell it to do some basic CEP on client side or to back off the, uh, the, um, the uh, sampling frequency. But the reality is, in a conventional data center, this kind of data is like, not even close to noise. You know, what re what's really going on there in terms of you know, media type content moving around and all the other kind of control plane type stuff, it's a nit, is what we find. I don't know where it's too many. Sorry, I think you were in first. Is this information published anywhere? Where can we find it? Bits and pieces of it. Bits and pieces of it are published. Um, some of it's going into a current IEEE journal. Lots of it is in deliverable reports from the FP7 projects that I've mentioned, but none of it is called Apex Lake. Today is the first day we've mentioned Apex Lake outside the company. So if I did a Google search, what term should I use? Um, you could look at monitoring Intel Labs Europe. You could look at SLAs, SLA management, Intel Labs Europe. Um, pretty soon you'll be seeing application adaptation. The uh, Cloud Wave is the project. I mean, I can give you a list of the projects for sure, um, current and future. And, and we're not the only people doing these projects. So, I mean, we would have, leaving aside the universities, the, the industry partners we would have would be IBM in Haifa, the, the research labs in Haifa there, um, SAP, um, uh, lots of operators, pretty much all the big operators and telcos around Europe we're working with, um, the OEMs and the TEMs, um, people like ALU, um, Ericsson, Nokia Siemens, all these guys. Um, we're in collaborations with, with pretty much, it's almost a who's who of, of um, cloud services and future network type research. Um, in, in the jargon of the framework stuff, we refer to the objectives 1.1 and 1.2 respectively. Um, that's, that's kind of the game, that's the, that's the, the area we play in. Um, sorry, more questions? Um, the application, the graph that you show, um, first, it, it could be actually dynamic in the sense of what you're making fluid could change. Yes. And also, how do you actually get this, unless you have visibility across the sky, object volume, migration? Yeah, so the whole provenancing thing is, is a topic one right now. In fact, if I bring the thing back up, and try to, something I didn't show you was the time slider. Uh, which tab is it on? It's, is, it, is that one? So here is a little time slider and I can, now, I mean, this UI, I don't think any, there is no kind of scenario where a human offer, operator would ever use a, a UI like this other than to demonstrate it in a room like this. Um, <laughs> but more of the context that we're capturing is snapshotting. We're already snapshotting anyway. Um, but we do not have, for example, convincing queries that would give you a view of what happened to trigger and during and as a consequence of that migration. That would be some kind of characterization that we've got to figure out. All right, so this is live work, by the way. I mean, it's not something kind of we're done with and now we're here to, to kind of share it. It's, this is ongoing stuff in our group. We're far from done with it. You know, we're going to be on this stuff for, for the foreseeable future. As I said, this is purely for, you know, it's a toy, it's, this is a toy UI. Um, our work is focused on how do we get rid of that and be able to reason over a 10,000 node scenario. But just thinking about 
the, um, the data collection infrastructure, the, mm -hmm. uh, the sampling takes place? Mm -hmm. So we, um, right now, um, the agents basically publish to pretty much any messaging system, um, AMQP, RabbitMQ. Um, it's, it's stored in a TSDB, time series database. Um, we have not had the challenge of scale. We're actually talking about this right now. You know, should we, in our next steps, should we do the SLA integration and um, stuff to do with um, the heterogeneity, or should we go back and look at scale in particular? Now, the reason we're not looking at scale is because Nick, who was supposed to be here, is on scale, right? So if he was here, he'd tell you his answer to that. Um, so he's actually working on a project that is specifically designed just to do the plumbing at scale and nothing else. Um, after that, it's just another big data problem. In actual fact, technically, it's a subgraph isomorph isomorphism problem. And usually I can say that without tripping over it. Um, so um, I, that's kind of a roundabout answer to your question is, That what you're looking for? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, peer-to-peer, -peer, um, hierarchical structures. Uh, we've looked at nearest neighbor. There's a whole bunch of things, but we're not looking at those seriously. That's not. It's not front and central to what we think is interesting right now. Uh, we think we have a bit to go in terms of really proving out that we can move from something that's intuitive to a human to something that's parametric and natural to, you know, a machine reasoning process. That's where our focus is. Mm -hmm. So those are typically your time series type of samples, like I iris stack or anything like that, or and configuration type of things. Or? It can be that, um, but it can also be other stuff like queue lengths. Um, queue lengths are very interesting. Um, the methodology that's been behind our approach to performance analysis for some years has been the um, use USE, if you've heard of it, utilization, saturation, and errors. Yeah. So it's Brendan Gregg stuff. So for the saturation stuff in particular, we're looking at queue lengths and latencies. Um, you, can, you can get a lot of insight from looking at that stuff. At, at multiple levels, right, right up through the application, but what's the DBMS seeing? Is it waiting on locks? You know, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And then the time series stuff, I don't think there's anything in OpenStack today, right, that can capture time series. I don't know. Uh, not sure if it's a focus. I mean, our work, I mean, we're, I'll have to be honest, I mean, we're, we use OpenStack. We have it deployed in our in our uh, in our test bed, but we've never touched a line of code, um, so we're not as close as. Okay, somebody's somebody's contradicting me. Okay, so you touch code, right? What you do? What you break? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Um, but like I said, our, our focus has been just moving as fast as we can to get the concept on the table, which means we we kept it separate. It complements. It coexists for now, but. You know, if, if we had time or if we had enough, you know, channels open with other people who are interested, then yeah, that'd be great stuff to go and explore. For your, for your prototype and model that you've done, do you use your own proprietary time series stuff or do you use some off the shelf time series repository of? Oh, we just use a TSDB and it's back ended onto a um, Hadoop. This, it, this was very sort of incremental work. It started in spreadsheets. Right? So there was no kind of grand plan for, for this from, from day one. Uh, we were, it started from, you know, the problem statement originally on that stuff was when you, when you start to transition from spindles to SSDs, bottlenecks start moving around at an alarming rate. And how do you keep up with where they're moving? That's what started that work way back. That was like five, six years ago. That was the problem statement. Any more questions? So I don't know if the decks for these things get kept, but I did park some email addresses on those. Um, there's three of us from the group here in the room, so if, if anybody's interested, make contact. It. We're going to be here for the next few days, um, almost a week. Uh, we'd be quite interested in hearing more.